Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in which we are discussing the opioid receptors. Okay, so we're in the process of trying to understand how opioids work. We've now looked at the ascending pain pathways, and basically we want to understand how opioid drugs take actions to block those ascending pathways. Okay, and basically one of the major means by which they do it is by hijacking a system that the brain already has for inhibiting those ascending uh, pain pathways, basically. So what we're going to first discuss is this mechanism the brain has for um, inhibiting the ascending pain pathways, which is these descending inhibitory pathways. Okay, and you will probably heard stories of athletes and soldiers who uh, had um, huge, well, who should have been in, a in agony, basically, um, because of uh, what they've done to themselves or what has happened to them. Uh, but they don't feel the pain, and this is because uh, in situations of uh, extreme uh, danger, for instance, if a soldier has got some horrendous wound but is in life-threatening danger, the brain will use these descending inhibitory pathways to block the ascending pain pathways so that the soldier doesn't feel the pain and he can still function to try and get himself out of there um, and um, get himself to safety. So in times of life-threatening danger, these descending inhibitory pathways will inhibit the ascending pain pathways. In addition, um, basically athletes who have done huge great distances, say let's say someone who's jogged for a huge great distance, they should be in agony. But whilst you're actually doing the exercise, uh, these descending inhibitory pathways will be activated to some degree and they will stop uh, the um, ascending pain pathways. And it's only when you actually stop jogging that you then suddenly feel the agony of what you've done to yourself because then the descending pathways turn off and you suddenly feel all the pain. So generally athletes will complete a race and then they will be in agony afterwards. Far more agony than they were when they were actually doing the race because the descending inhibitory pathways have stopped. Okay, so how do these descending inhibitory pathways work? What's the architecture of them? Well, basically, it starts, or at least what we know about it, starts with the periaqueductal gray, okay, uh, which is a portion of gray matter that is surrounding the cerebral aqueduct uh, in the midbrain. Okay, so we're going to go back to the midbrain, which, remember, was this structure on top of the pons here. And what we're now going to draw is a cross-section of the midbrain. So if you imagine slicing through the midbrain like this, we're going to draw that cross-section, basically. Okay, and we're going to draw a cross-section as though you've cut through quite high up. Okay, so what you will see is something that looks like this. Okay, so I said at the time when we first discussed the midbrain that it looks like a Mickey Mouse structure, and it really does. When you see it on an MRI scan, it, it's very distinguishable. It does look as though Mickey Mouse is smiling back at you, okay? And it sort of has this structure, but when I, whenever I draw the midbrain, it always looks more like a pig than Mickey Mouse. Uh, but in the reality, it does look uh, like Mickey Mouse. Okay, so, uh, basically, uh, this is the sort of cross-section, the overall shape of the midbrain. You have these two processes that um, project forwards, and these are known as crus cerebri, okay? And they will have, running through them, a lot of axons, okay? So the first portion here is known as crus cerebri, and running through this is just loads and loads of axons. For instance, the corticospinal tract, which is a descending tract that's extremely important in uh, movement, uh, runs through this anterior portion here. Behind that, you then have quite a dark portion, okay, which I'll show here. So this is a dark portion, which is known as substantia nigra, okay? And this is extremely important uh, in the nigrostriatal dopamine system, okay? So again, it's very important in the um, control of movement in the motor system. And there are problems with this uh, substantia nigra in Parkinson's disease. Okay, so this is the substantia nigra. 
Okay, then you have the cerebral aqueduct running through the middle of this, okay? And you remember when we were doing the um, cross sections of the spinal cord, we had uh, the central canal. This is actually the same thing as that, but just much higher up, basically. So this is uh, a connection between uh, the fourth ventricle, which is below it, in behind the pons, and then the third ventricle, which is above it, and sits between the two phalami, which are on top of the midbrain. Okay, so this is the cerebral aqueduct. Okay, so it's just full of um, cerebrospinal fluid. And the periaqueductal gray is a little region of gray matter that surrounds the cerebral aqueduct. Okay, so I'm going to color this in. So, this a uh, portion of grey matter that surrounds the cerebral aqueduct here, which I'm now colouring in in turquoise. Uh, this is the periaqueductal grey. And for short, the periaqueductal grey is often abbreviated to the P for peri, A for aqueductal, and then G for grey. Okay, now, um, we've got the periaqueductal grey. I just want to add on a few more landmarks onto the midbrain, okay, to make you convinced that it does look like Mickey Mouse. Okay, so here you have two very distinguishable uh, nuclei, okay, and these are the red nuclei. So uh, the one that I put my arrow to is actually the right red nucleus, but you also have the left red nucleus as well. Okay, so you have the two red nuclei, and they obviously form Mickey Mouse's eyes. Okay, and then also these little projections backwards. Can you see it's sort of curved backwards? These little bits, these are the superior colliculi. Okay, so the superior colliculi. Right, uh, so those are a few little landmarks of the uh, midbrain. So, the periaqueductal grey then. You have a lot of cell bodies here in this um, region of grey matter, and basically what happens is they project downwards, okay, onto some special nuclei which are within the medulla, okay, known as the Raffi nuclei, and there are many of these. So we're not going to go through uh, their names, uh, but know that they are nuclei, so they're places where you have loads of cell bodies together. So remember, if you have a collection of cell bodies in the central nervous system, that's called a nucleus. If you have a collection of cell bodies that is outside of the central nervous system, that's called a ganglion. Okay, so let's draw a, a picture where we're looking at this from the side, because it's easier to draw it from the side than it is to draw it from the front. Okay, so here we've got the midbrain at the top. So we've got our periaqueductal grey matter here. Okay, which is in the centre of the midbrain, surrounding the cerebral aqueduct. Okay, then underneath we've got the pons here, and then the medulla below. Okay, so basically these neurons in the periaqueductal grey, they will project down to special nuclei, and there are multiple of these nuclei which are within the medulla. Okay, and these nuclei are called the Raffe nuclei. Okay, so there's many of them. This is an example of a Raffe nucleus that I'm drawing here. Okay, uh, so I'll put a few more of them and then put another arrow to it to make my plural um, worthwhile. Okay, so the neurons in the periaqueductal gray project down and activate neurons in the Raffe nuclei. And basically, these neurons in the Raffe nuclei will then project downwards as well. Uh, they'll be activated by the neurons in the periaqueductal gray, and they'll project down then, uh, down into the spinal cord, and they will go all the way down to the places where the primary pain neurons project onto the secondary pain neurons. Okay, so let me draw this out again. So if we take our cross section of the spinal cord again, okay, and we'll just draw a little cross section here. So here's our spinal cord, the ventral sulcus at the front here, the posterior septum at the back here, and then we've got our grey matter in this sort of characteristic shape here like so. Okay, and remember we've got the tract of Lizawa right at the back, and then we've got substantia gelatinosa nearby the back of the uh, dorsal horn. Okay, and the primary neuron comes in and will synapse on the secondary neuron, which will then cross over in this anterior commissure of the spinal cord and then go into the spinothalamic tract. So basically, these neurons from the Raffae nuclei, they go down and 
intervene in ways that are still not particularly understood. They intervene with the neurotransmission from the primary neuron here, which is either an A delta neuron or um, a C fiber, and the secondary neuron here, which then takes the signal up to the brain. Okay, and they work to block uh, the neurotransmission across there, but it's still not really understood how that occurs. Okay, because these neurons release serotonin, the raphe nuclei are famous as the source of serotonin. Okay, so these neurons from the raphe nuclei they release serotonin, and somehow serotonin blocks. Um, well, it works to block, whether it does it directly or whether it activates other things that then go on to um, block uh, these um, neurotransmission across here. But serotonin blocks the neurotransmission from the primary neuron to the secondary neuron. Okay, right. So, we're now ready to um, discuss the action of opioids. And I should just say, uh, to complete the descending inhibitory pathway, basically certain portions of the cortex can activate the periaqueductal gray, which then activates the raphe nucleus, which then turns off the perception of pain. And it's not just doing this at certain places, it will do it all over the spinal cord, so that all of your uh, primary neurons can no longer activate the secondary neurons, and hence you've effectively just turned pain off, basically. Okay, uh, so how do opioids act then? Okay, well, this is a big question. Basically, they act all over the place. Firstly, they act to block this synapse directly themselves. Okay, on these primary neurons, the axon terminals of these primary neurons will have mu opioid receptors on their surface. Okay? the opioids will activate mu opioid receptors, such as, for instance, morphine will activate mu opioid receptors. We've discussed that when you activate mu opioid receptors on axon terminals, that will stop this axon terminal from being able to release neurotransmitter, and hence you have blocked neurotransmission from the primary neuron to the secondary neuron. But we know that that is not the only way that these opioids work, because if you inject opioids directly into the peri aqueductal gray or directly into the raphe nuclei, uh, they also trigger uh, analgesia basically. So there are many levels on which opioids work and this is one of them. Okay, And we believe opioids also work to activate the descending pathways. So potentially what could be happening is there could be neurons um, which are within the periaqueductal gray and within the raphe nuclei, which are inhibiting, okay, so I'll just draw this like here, okay, so basically there could be neurons in the periaqueductal gray and the raphe nuclei which are inhibiting the neurons of the periaqueductal gray and the raphe nuclei, and hence are inhibiting this downstream pathway. So let me say this again. This neuron here, for instance, will continuously be uh, releasing an inhibitory neurotransmitter onto this neuron of the periaqueductal gray and of the descending pathway and stopping it from firing. So it won't fire, it won't activate the raphe nuclei neurons, and therefore you won't get the descending inhibition of this um, synapse between the primary neuron and the secondary neuron. Okay? If the opioids... Uh, were to inhibit the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter by acting on opioid receptors on the axon terminals of these inhibitory neurons, then that would stop the inhibition of this neuron. It would then fire and activate the raphe nuclei uh, neurons, which would then activate the descending inhibitory pathway and stop uh, the uh, transmittance of um, the signal, the pain signal from the primary neuron to the secondary neuron. It's the same principle for inhibitory neurons at the level of the raphe nuclei. If we had inhibitory neurons which were inhibiting the uh, neurons of the raphe nuclei which are part of the descending pathway, then if those inhibitory neurons had opioid receptors on their axon terminals, then the opioids could activate those opioid receptors and that would block the release of neurotransmitter by the inhibitory neuron, which would then stop it from inhibiting the neurons of the raphe nuclei and the raphe nuclei would now fire and uh, again block the neurotransmitter. So we believe the main way 
the opioids deliver analgesia is actually by activating the descending inhibitory pathway rather than by directly inhibiting this synapse themselves, but they can directly block the synapse themselves. Okay, so there are a huge number of different ways that opioids produce analgesia. Okay, that then now concludes our discussion of the opioid receptors.